James. How is your uh, training um, adventure? Oh, it's good. I'm leaving for Australia in another week for two seminars in Australia. I wanted to, uh, to ask uh, this time about the, some details of the uh, Bruce's system. Uh, the, there's the, the first system and the, your details of your system. Well, there were, there were different f phases of Bruce. Bruce, when he first came to the United States, uh, uh, had sort of been almost kicked out of Hong Kong. He'd been in a lot of trouble, a lot of fights. He was going to be arrested. He'd been expelled from high school. He'd been in a lot, a lot of trouble. He had fought a, uh, a triad, you know, like the Chinese mafia, and uh, beat up one of the triad's son, and so they were going to put a hit or kill list on him. Mm. The parents decided he, he needed to get out of Hong Kong before he went to jail or got killed. So uh, he was 18 years old, and he'd been training in a lot of different Kung Fu styles. And he'd been beaten, he'd won fights, lost fights. So when he, at 18, he had to claim citizenship to the United States or one of the other British or American citizenship. So he, his parents sent him to the United States. Now, he wanted to continue training in order to be able to become a Hollywood movie star mm -hmm. because he'd been a movie star in Hong Kong. So, But in order to do that, he had to have something unique, some skill, and fighting was his only skill. So that's why when he first started training, he mainly focused on fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, that He surrounded himself with a lot of punks, uh, street fighters like myself, Jesse, Ed, Leroy, Skip, and that was just to make him better because the better we got, the better he got. Mm -hmm. but once he learned, once he developed his basic fighting skill, what he believed would allow him to beat anyone, he decided that he needed to be able to start making money in order to go to Hollywood. So he started to teach a structured, organized uh, martial arts system mm -hmm. that he called Jun Fan, or his Chinese name, Jun Fan Li. Jun Fan Li. Uh -huh. Jun Fan, he called it Jun Fan. Uh -huh. And the, the, the reason he did this is just to make money. Mm -hmm. But he didn't want to teach people to beat him. So therefore, he left out a certain, certain uh, principles, certain concepts, what we call the closed by zone, how he stood and, and actually fought, the center line concept, spring energy concept, the different concepts that really were the essence of what made him good, he left out in June Fun. And uh, then he went from June Fun down to uh, Oakland and California, and that's when he decided to do JKD or Jeet Kune Do. Mm -hmm. It create a system that he could open up schools and make money. Uh, but he still left out those key elements. And, of course, from there, he went on to become, you know, the Hollywood movie star. But actually, there were three phases of his training. One is his fighting style, which is, was 59, 60, 61 period. And then he moved to the June Fon period, which was his uh, uh, making money to get away from Ruby Chow's restaurant. And uh, uh, then he went to the JKD period, which is to uh, become much more flashy. In other words... Jun Fan did not have kicks and flashy movements, whereas JKD did. JKD had a lot of very visual kind yes. of movements, and he needed those for the movies. So he started to get into a lot of kicking, I wonder, whereas in fighting, what, Bruce did not believe in kicking at all. In, in Jun Fan, uh, was not kicking. In other words, there was not. He did not emphasize kicking in Jun Fan. Uh, hit the uh, real emphasis on kicking came in Jeet Kune Do in, June, in his uh, L.A. period because he found that that movies and theaters, he needed something very visual. And Wing Chun is a very tight, quick system. It's not very visual. In other words, you cannot see what's going on because it's mainly feel close quarter combat. Mm -hmm. So he started to do a lot more exaggerated movements, and kicking was one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, notice how much he kicked in the movies? I mean, he was always kicking. Mm -hmm. That was because it was very visual. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Chuck Norris, very, very visual kicking. Yes. So that, that is why Bruce 
focus on kicking, making people think that he kicked a lot. Whereas in fighting, he believed that kicking was the worst thing you can do because that meant you gave up your base, you gave up your, your mobility, you gave yes. up your, your stability. So if someone got a hold of your leg, you could easily be manipulated and controlled. So Bruce did not believe in kicking in a fight mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it was illogical. Mm -hmm. So, because he was very small frame, so he knew that he had to have a good solid uh, base for power for controlling the opponent, and he couldn't do that if he had one leg flying around. Mm -hmm. That was the three phases of, of Bruce's fighting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was it was just a hand uh, hand fight. Bruce was a trapper, which meant that when Bruce fought. He did not want to get hit. And in order not to get hit, he had to control you. So in order to control you, he had to be able to engage you and control your arms. But by controlling your arms, he also controlled all of your body movement. Because when he touched you, he grounded you. In other words, he used spring energy, ground you, so that you could not kick or move. So therefore, Bruce knew that if he got within range where you could hit him, He had to control you so that he could, could stop you from hitting him. That's why Chi Sao yes, is yes. important, mm -hmm. because it was the basis for trapping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. What, uh, this, this is all the difference uh, from the, uh, the first um, system of Bruce Lee and the Jeet Kune Do. Yeah, there were three. There, there were three. The, not a system. The fighting was just totally, every day we, we, we trained in something different, or Bruce was always thinking of different ways to do things. There was no structure, no organization, no white belt, yellow belt, orange belt, anything like that. Mm -hmm. We didn't even look Bruce, at Bruce Lee like Sifu or the instructor. He was just yeah. the guy who knew a lot of stuff that we were training with. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of times... Someone else would kind of lead the class, showing things about boxing or judo or jiu-jitsu or something. So it was just a mixture of training. It was only when he got into Jun Fon mm -hmm. that he began to organize and structure rank mm -hmm. levels. One, two, three, four. We'll first do yeah. this, then we'll do this, then we'll do that. So that's where the actual structure and system, that's why you can look at Jun Fon as a system because it had organization and structure. Jeet Kune Do had organization and structure. You had levels. You had, you know, tips of uh, different ranks that you went through, learning different things. Yeah. Did not have that in the beginning. That was totally non-existent. It, it, we just didn't have any rank or any structure or any form. So that's why you have to look at the the evolution of what Bruce did from nothing, just pure fighting. Mm -hmm. which is art. That's what I teach. I teach Bruce Lee's core principles of, of what he used, what was speed, what was power, how do you trap, where, where do you begin in trapping, what is spring energy, why do you stand like you do, what do we mean by setup, entry, engagement, and, and control. Mm -hmm. That's what I specialize in, mm -hmm. because that's all we did in those days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what, kind of, uh, what, what kind of punches Uh, he had at this at that time. Well, he started off with the classical Wing Chun punches, the center line control punches, which are are mainly through the center. Uh -huh. And then the, the the reason for the center line punching was to control the center line, just to keep the opponent's energy outside of the center line. Yes. Because by doing that, you kept the opponent's energy open and wide. But yes. when you Punch through the center line, the problem biomechanically from a science standpoint is it's a weak punch. Because of the angles that energy is traveling up the arms, it is not really a power line. So therefore, it took a lot more effort to try and hurt someone, or you know, knock someone down, which Bruce at 135 pounds found it difficult to do, because some of us were 100 pounds more than him, mm -hmm. 7,500 pounds. So he couldn't hurt us with the center line punch. He could, he could frustrate us, he could hit us, but we're like bee stings. Mm -hmm. So we began to change the way that we hit to what we call the power line, where we structurally, when we hit, actually align the bones and the body so that you could transfer power much more effectively than the center line punching. 
But you still had from the center line, you could control the center line yeah. by aiming your elbows out. Yes. Now this to a power line line, uh -huh. but it also did the center line. Mm -hmm. So Bruce found that when he hit, and you have to underline, underline the word hit, when he hit, he used the power line. When he went in to engage, he used the center line of flourishing. <clears throat> You know, just very fast yeah. because it, it and, and, and disorganized the opponent. Mm -hmm. But once he started to hit, Bruce used the power line, which I refer to as the power line. It's a certain way of striking with what we call the chung choi. Chung choi. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of people from around the world have been asking me about the structure. And what I'm putting online in the next few weeks mm -hmm. is a, is a, Presentation in video mm -hmm. and print of all these principles the center line principle, the stance, why I do it, and everything else. A site called Teachable. Mm -hmm. Teachable is a site that presents academic information that people uh, can, can uh, get to actually train in. In other words, rather than to throw a whole bunch of stuff. A lot of people are only interested in certain things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present like uh, blocking techniques, the Tan Sao, Pak Sao, Lok Sao, how we did them and why we did them. Mm -hmm. the oh, yeah. Now the thing is that, in other words, what is the difference between the Jun Fan stance and the JKD stance mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and the closed Baijun that we did? Well, there's a lot of difference and uh, I want to show people the difference. So that way there, they'll be able to know what Bruce D. Lee did in those early days in Seattle when I trained with him, versus when he trained with Taki Kamara and uh, Danny Nisanto. And I, I'm not saying what I do is better, I'm just saying it's different. It's up to the student to make it valuable, to put value on it. Mm -hmm. It's up to the student to look at it and say, I like that or I don't like that. that that's the thing about JKD, that's, you, you ultimately are going to be your own fighter, your own person. Mm -hmm. So my JKD, my Gamal JKD, is my interpretation of my period of time with Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what teachable uh, mm -hmm. program will be about, and that's that's just because I'm I'm too old now. I'm almost eighty years old, and, and I'm just tired, and I I cannot do a lot of the things. So I need to present them while I can still present them. Yes, yes, you can represent the science of the martial art. People can, people can say, well, Jim DeMille said this and Jim DeMille meant that. Well, how in the hell do they know what I said meant more than I do myself? So yes. that's why it's important that I present these things personally rather than let someone else do it. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Can I ask you about the, what, what is the role of the uh, direct punch uh, with the front hand? Was there uh, in the in the first system? Was it in uh, in the Jun Fan? You mean where they lead with the right hand? Yes, yes. The the first. Bruce would never do that in a fight. Never. Bruce, ne Bruce never. Well, let's think about it logically. Bruce was a trapper. One of the essence key elements of Wing Chun mm -hmm. is to seek the hands. In other words, they want to trap. Now, in order to trap, you have to engage the hands. So, when you enter, what you want the person to do is bring up their hands and do something to defend. So, that's that's the thing that I that I underline when I'm when I'm uh, talking about in a real fight. Certain things you do not want to tell your opponent. One is that you're a fighter in the first place. Another is is that whether you're right-handed or left-handed whether you're a boxer or a kicker. In other words, you don't want to give him this information because that makes him uh, uh, more difficult to deal with because he knows more about you. Bruce's whole thing was he should know nothing about you. So Bruce, when he started the fight, did two, one of two things. One is distance. He made sure that he was slightly out of your reach so that he could react if you did something. Next, he always stood with his hands by his side or he played with his upper button. He would go like this. Because from there, boom, he could just suddenly leap out. Uh -huh. But if he went like this, you didn't know whether you were, he was left-handed or right-handed. You yes. didn't know whether he was a boxer. He stood in such a way that he could close on you, but you didn't look like it. In other words, his feet were 
were slightly spread. His right was knitting slightly, but it didn't look like he was in any kind of a stance. So this gave him a chance now to engage you either to absorb your energy if you attack him or for you to reach out and strike at him, to be able to, to uh, force his hand, the opponent's hands to come up. Now the reason he did that is because he wanted to engage them. Now my whole point is that if I'm standing in front of you with my right hand meeting in any form, yes. I'm dipping my hand. Yes. yes. You know I'm right-handed if I'm right leading or left leading. Yes. Well, that's stupid. Right away I'm telling you I'm a martial artist or I'm not a victim. So therefore it's going to be harder for you to for me to attack you because that means you're going to be more ready because you're leery of me. Of course. Do that. So that's why one of the things that Bruce never did is extend his hand out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why did he do that? I haven't the foggiest, uh, other than it looked good, it looked martial arty. But from a fighting standpoint, from our standpoint as street fighters, it was stupid. You don't give somebody your hand. Yeah. yeah. So if I put out my hand, that creates a distance of a threat. That means you're going to stay further away from my hand if you feel threatened. But if my hand's down, that means you're going to be a little closer to me which means, well, boom, my attack, I only have to close a shorter distance. Yes, yes. Certain logic when you think of fighting, a certain practicality that lets you know right away that the stance that Bruce Lee presented in JKD and even June Fon, June Fon was not as bad, is that it was a stance that Bruce would have never used himself in a fight. Mm-hmm. Because was totally against all the principles of, especially the element of surprise. You've totally eliminated the element of surprise. So if Bruce stood in front of you, he did not look threatening. He looked like a victim. He did not present anything that caused you to move to a higher state of readiness. When I do a demonstration or I do a seminar, mm. I show them, you know, because then they understand it, because I physically show them the difference between standing there in a neutral but attacking stance and a stance in which I'm telegraphing everything that I know. And they quickly pick it up and understand it. Yeah. There's why I like the science of Bruce Lee. You know, I'm, I'm explaining to you from a biomechanical standpoint why I do this or why I don't do that. You know, if I'm relaxed and loaded, I can explode at you. But if I've got my hands forward, I can't explode because I'm already using energy extended to hold up my arms. Yeah. I raise my left heel, as they do in JKD, that means that my center of gravity is raising, forcing me to lean slightly forward, forcing me to press more into my forward foot. So therefore, I'm, I'm grounded more than I want to be. You know, I can balance with my body, but yet because of my rear heel is raised like they do in, in, in JKD, that forces you to be more grounded. Which, if you do that to me, I know for a split second, I can attack you before you can move back because you're grounded too much. You can lean back, you can start to go back, but for a minute you cannot really absorb my attack. So these are principles in biomechanics that are so important in learning fighting concepts. This is original fighting concepts. The science of fighting, not the art of fighting. Uh, did he uh, Did he have so uh, big power of the punch? Did, no. did he show, no. show was, was after? Actually, he couldn't hit very hard because he was only 135 pounds. Uh -huh. When he hit us, he could hit us, you know, five, six times and do nothing other than irritate us. Because if Bruce hit us, we could still fight back. Bruce didn't like that. Mm -hmm. He had to trap. The power punch came from Bruce and I going down to my apartment and working on different ways of punching. How do you, how do you get the maximum amount of power out of your body? And how do you transfer that energy into your opponent? Mm -hmm. Classical Wing Chun had a, a basic punch in which they extended out, and when they hit, they jerk their, their wrists. Yes, yes. Notice when they do it, it's full extension. Yes. You empty out your cup, and all of all your energy is gone. And when you trap someone, you're in very close range. You want to be able to hit with tremendous power. Yes. So that's why we worked on what is referred to as the floating power punch. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a video on it, I have a book on it, uh, I've explained it, how it works. Uh, it, it's really something that we developed in those early years, primarily so that Bruce could you know, drop you with one single punch. 
and we developed it and said that, that he could do it. Uh, so that weight and size and gender didn't make any difference. In other words, a 10-year-old could knock me out very easy, and I'm 225 pounds. Mm. If how to hit and where to hit. So we, we worked on power, and we worked on power delivery, which is two different sciences. How do you maximize the use of body power, kinetic power, mass in motion power, twitching power, converging power, all these different emotional powers, all these different powers are power. Yeah. Now, deliver it. It's a different concept. Now you're talking about methodology. How do you strike? you strike vertical fist or horizontal fist? Yeah. Which is better. Do you strike with the floating wrist so that you transfer and roll yeah. the energy? See what I mean? It, there's a science behind yes. it. What is the, the better way to, uh, to punch the, much the most power? What was the finish, the result of, of, of this? Understand, the body absorbs power very easy. By that I simply mean that if you hit someone, yeah. all the, that's why black and blue, that means all the cells in the area you hit die. Mm -hmm. Now, what they're dying is they're sacrificing themselves in order to protect the internal organs. Yes. They allow all the damage to be on the surface. The floating punch, because it floats and, and, and jolts the energy, it makes the energy go like this rather than this way. Mm -hmm. This way is a great punch. Mm -hmm. This way is way boxers hit. Mm -hmm. And the energy is in and does damage directly. Yeah. You float the punch with a certain dynamic mo movement, the energy goes like this. Mm -hmm. What it does is it tends to bypass the surface and affect the internal organs. That's why when I hit somebody in a demonstration, they hold a phone book. I don't know if you've ever looked on YouTube and, and looked up my power punch. Yes, yes, I see it. Okay, when you see me hitting, and you see them, boom, yes. I, hit, I literally left three people off the floor and knock them down. Yeah. I also do it, and I don't know if it's on YouTube, and one of my friends at one of my demos did, is I hit them, they fall down, and then I freeze my hand, and they bring up this glass. And I open up my hand and I crack a raw egg in it. Mm. And I get the demonstration with a raw egg in my hand. Mm -hmm. The reason I do that is, is one, to entertain people, but also to show them that you do not have to have a clenched, rigid fist. What you have to have is power alignment so that the knuckle, wrist, and yes. forearm yes. must be in alignment. All right. mm -hmm. So that way there, you can hold your hand actually very loose and do tremendous damage. So between my alignment of power and my floating of the wrist, I create this here shock. That's why you see the first person I hit begin to lift off the floor. Yes, yes. Go straight back. So this is where the, the power itself is one thing and the way that I hit is two things. In other words, I actually have two things, two separate arts going on at the same time. The art of method of striking. Yes. And the power. Mm -hmm. So there's where you have, it's very difficult for me to explain. You, you can look at it, I can show in video, or I can talk about it, but I have to actually hit you in order for you to understand the shock that goes yeah, through your bones. The bones just pop. It's because of the way that I hit. And that's that's why when, when, when you're talking about hitting, what is the best way to hit, you know? Whoops, excuse me. What if I hit vertical fist yeah. rather than Because horizontal is much weaker than vertical. Mm -hmm. It's much slower than vertical. Primarily because it's like if you take your hand and you extend it with vertical fist straight forward, mm -hmm. you feel your arm extending, no yeah. problem. Yeah. That's because the bicep is relaxing, allowing the tricep to extend the arm. Mm -hmm. When you pull the arm back, the bicep engages, the tricep relaxes. Of course. The same thing and turn your hand over and move your arm out, you'll find that the tricep and bicep both tighten up. Yes. And other yes. 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 So therefore you're working against your own energy. So when you see a karate or somebody hitting like that, yes. they're actually hitting with a weaker punch because their energy is drawing back against itself because of the tricep and bicep not working together. They antagonize each other. So not only are you making it more difficult, but because when you do that, your elbow goes out. That means your elbow absorbs a lot of the energy that's trying to go straight forward. But it can't go straight forward because it must go down the arm and make the turn into the elbow. 
though you've just broken your power line. Also, your arm is shorter, so therefore your range of reach is shorter because your tricep and bicep are pulling against one another. So in other words, there's all kinds of reasons why the, the horizontal fist is weaker and not as effective as the, horse, as the vertical fist. Uh -huh. what, what is the role of the power, uh, the legs and the other body? Well, it depends. Like, you can use the power, the, 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 the legs as a base for power, because anytime you hit something, yes. energy is going to go back up your body. For yes. every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, okay. basic physics. Of course. That means if I hit someone with 100 pounds, that 100 pounds, when I hit the object, is now going to all of a sudden reciprocate and go back up my arm. All right? Mm -hmm. Now, how well I absorb that will determine how much is transferred. If my elbow is out, if I'm standing vertical and I hit, I, 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 you'd have to see some of my video demonstrations of power. If I'm vertical, that means that my, my feet are my base. Yes. And there is no forward energy. So if I push forward, my back, my my upper torso wants to go like this. Why? Yes. Because the shoulder is very high, and that is what absorbing the energy of pushing. So as I push, my upper torso wants to go back. Yes. Now, to stop that, I need to lean slightly. Now, by leaning slightly, the energy not doesn't go this way. It tends to go this way. Yes, yes. Because now it's traveling down my body because of the angle. The more I go up to a point, it's a, it's good. And then at a certain point, I'm falling. Yes, yes. So, if you ever watch Bruce when he's hitting, you always see Bruce, just as he hits, he goes like this. Just oh, up. Yeah. Up. Yes. And feet are in such a way that is not only acting as a base all the way down, but he's also projecting forward with his legs, so he's transferring energy up not only through his arm, but through his whole leg, body, arcing over and transferring out. So the, the footwork, the base of the body, and how you use your center line to converge in it, all these points are very, very important in power mm -hmm. and transfer of power. That's why the close by Jean that we did, the stance we did, was so critical on everything that we did, trapping, closing on the opponent, staying with the opponent, spring energy control, Everything was based on the closed by Jean stance itself. Yes, mm -hmm. Bruce Lee, Lee left out when he, he started teaching Jun Fan. He left out the closed by Jean. Mm. He changed. Well, as soon as it changed the stance, that meant you could no longer trap in the same way. You could no longer spring energy and flow with your opponent. All of these things were dependent on that particular stance. Because in all the years I've been in the martial arts, which has been you know well over 50 years, I have never seen a stance as effective as the closed by zone stance. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things I teach in white belt is the closed by zone stance. Because everything I teach after that is based on that stance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This work, we, you know, when you talk about the body, the body power, it, it isn't just the body and body power, it's how you use it, how you, how you structure it. Mm -hmm. So that when you enter and you engage the opponent, you don't know what he's going to do. So therefore, you have to be able to adapt to anything that he does, and the closed by zone allows you to do that. Mm -hmm. He tries to aid, he tries to get away, he tries to move, he tries to come forward. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So that's that. When I teach the closed by zone, although it's a, it's actually fairly simple as far as the mechanics of it, showing you how I do it. Then you have to go through drills in order to make it work. Yeah. Uh, can I, can I, uh, um, to see the some some videos of the of this technique? Yeah, the, the, you know, it's it, that's one of the things that's going to be on my teachable thing. Uh huh. Okay. The close by Jean. Mm -hmm. What close by Jean? How does what is the stance? What are the angles? What what is the purpose of it? Uh, I'm, I'm going to show the center line. Mm -hmm. People don't understand the importance, the critical thing of the center line, because they say, yeah, Wing Chun, we have the center line. No, you don't have the center line. You have a center line in which you protect, you have a center line that you draw, and you have the right side and the left side. Of course. My center line is where, at any time I can reach out and touch you equal with any hand. 
either hand. My center line is no matter how you're facing, I'm going to always be centered in your central axis. Your central axis is a point in the center of your body. Mm -hmm. Now, how you're turned to me, you have a central axis relative to me. So I'm always attacking your central axis, but I'm always square. By that I mean that at any time I can reach out and touch you with either hand. Mm -hmm. Now this gives me two advantages. One is I'm very, I have a very solid upper torso power base. I'm very structurally solid because my energy is converging directly towards you. Yes. And it turns slightly from you. I'm changing my center of energy flow from you towards the direction that my shoulders are pointing. For instance, right now I'm looking directly at you. If I go like this and look over here, I can look at you, but my shoulders are pointing over here. Yes. That means my energy is going over there, not where I'm looking. So if I, if I turn to you and I go like this, that's very martial arty looking. Yes. But it's a very... Yes, yes. What? Because even though I'm projecting energy towards you, in reality my energy is going over that direction because that's where my shoulder centers it. Of course. <laughs> now that's my first reason more power, more of a base, which gives me much more structural power for fighting. But it also gives me two weapons. Mm -hmm. I can reach you with either hand. Now, as soon as I turn away from you, I really only have one weapon. Just one, yes. Like a gun in a holster. It does you no good unless you use it. So when you see the JKD stance of the person leading with the right hand, yep. that, he's not only giving you a weapon, I'm to attack, but he's also only got one weapon. And plus his energy is going over here. So therefore, I can easily control his energy. So we center, we're center line fighters. Bruce said that when you, once you enter and can reach your opponent, you must always, always, always be center line fighters. So that no matter what he does, you have two weapons. But the weapons are also sitting on a very strong base to fight with. In a closed-by zone, we are never in a closed-by zone if you're not fighting. In other words, it's not a ready stance. It's a fighting stance, mm -hmm. which means that I am a, I, I look relaxed, I'm comfortable, beep, bop, bop. The fight starts, boom, I'm in on you. I'm now a center line. I'm now closed by Joe because now we've engaged. Yeah. Disengage, I'm no longer concerned about the center line because I'm out of distance of range for you to touch me. Once I'm within range to touch, I either back up or I attack. Yes. But I don't stand there in a stance to see what you're going to do. So that's why you have to understand the difference between a ready stance, a pre-fight stance, where the guy's moving around playing martial arts, and a fight stance in which you've engaged the fight is on. At that time, it's the only time we do the closed budget. Right. Can I ask uh, the, about the um, defense? Uh, what or how uh, how Bruce uh, builds the defense elements? Well, we used to talk about defense. When we first started, Bruce had ways of standing because of the Wing Chun stance in which the lower leg protected the groin. Then he realized it was foolish to think at all in terms of defense as far as building a defense in. Your defense has to be built into the offense. What I mean by that is that if I attack you and I'm 100% to destroy you, I've never met anybody who could counter if you try. In other words, the, the, the defense is that you can do nothing. It's hard for me to explain. You know, once we enter, we have like what we call Wusau. Wusau is a defensive hand position for the other side that defensive, which is in alignment with your opposite arm so that you cannot strike me straight in. In order to strike me, you have to go around or under. Meanwhile, my other hand is attacking. Now, I'm attacking either to actually hit you or draw up your hands. Or I'm very careful on when I attack. If you look like a kicker, I'm not just going to rush you and run into the kick because you may have a split second to kick me, you'll be very good. Mm -hmm. However, if I cause you to move, I cause you for a moment to, to be distracted, then I attack. Because all I need is a tenth of a second and your kick is no good. So if I can distract you either by asking you a question or making a movement, boom, I'm in. Mm -hmm. So that's what closing to us is so important. Runge close, steal a step, skip a step, 
run over clover, butterfly clover. We have all these closes. They're for different types of people. Mm -hmm. And this is why when I say they're set up, in other words, I'm, I'm analyzing what kind of person you are, because you're the bad guy. Remember, I'm the good guy. I don't want to fight. I don't want any trouble. Yep. Why is this taking place? Well, it's because you're bringing it to me. So I have to analyze, are you a kicker? Are you a boxer? Are you a grappler? Are you a shooter? Or, you know, a jiu-jitsu? I do this from slightly out of range. But once I know there's going to be a fight, then I'm going to put myself in a position to attack for the kind of fighter I've interpreted you to be. That means that I'm going to close on you with a certain type of close, and I'm going to be at a certain distance that I can get within trapping distance within a tenth of a second. Now, this is why when, we, when we're engaging in fighting, we, we have to put these different components together. Set up means I'm analyzing you. Entry means I'm closing. Engagement means that you are reacting to my clothes and control, which either means I'm going to trap you and put you into a jujitsu lock or something to let you know, hey, don't don't mess around. Maybe you've been drunk and you're just being an idiot and I don't want to hurt you, yes. but I want you to know that I can hurt you. So I may trap you and put you into a what you might call a small circle jujitsu lock, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or I may just knock you out, take your head off. Of course, of course. So that's the sequence that Bruce. Then we train for fighting, and we would we would we would say, okay, set up. How do you set someone up? How do you enter? What are the closes that we would use? What well, what kind of people might we attack? So that's where we would take turns being different opponents. Uh, I would be a wrestler who shot in, or a jujitsu, or uh, you know, just a street fighter who just came in like you know, mm -hmm. boxing, mm -hmm. or an act professional boxer. Yes. Bruce would analyze the best way to deal with that. This is built into our attack. That's my whole point. There is no defense. Mm -hmm. There is no defense. If attack me, I attack you. It's very simple. Yes, yes. I'm not going to all of a sudden block, 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 block. I will be no. first, always. I, I need to be first. Yes. You be first, but you can be second and first. There's a there's a principle out of out of Wing Chun called Lin Seal Dai Dar. Mm -hmm. Lin Seal Dai Dar means that you are not doing a block. You're not doing a punch, you're not doing a close, you're doing a block, punch, close all at the same time. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> I hit you. Yep. Now, if my, my hand comes out, I'm defending and attacking, or I'm double trapping. But at the same time, my feet are going in. <clears throat> and every time I move, everything is moving at the same time, but always into my opponent, into my opponent. Yeah. Whereas in, in MMA and, and, and martial arts, you see the guy come in, they stop at a certain distance and they smack one another. They kick one. That's the most stupid thing I've ever seen. Of course. Well, all these. Uh, yes, yes. This is this is this is just a show. It's not. It's not a street. It's not. It's not a real fight. It's real, but it's real with bad concepts. Yeah. Do you understand? A lot of people actually believe what they do works, but they haven't really analyzed it scientifically to understand the flaws in it. Whereas Bruce did. Mm hmm. In, in boxing, you know in a ring, you're, you're required to do, you can't kick the guy, you can't grapple, you can't throw him to the ground. They're just boxing. Okay, those are rules. But in Muay Thai, and, and what you see in Thailand, is that they, they knee, kick, elbow, smack one another because they have a certain distance they fight from. Mm -hmm. But they get within that distance and stop going forward so that they can smack and hit one another. So they're, they're beating each other to death. They have no spring load. They have no lint seal die dar or pose, 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 pose. And this is something from a fighting standpoint I don't understand. But that's because they they don't understand the concept of constant pressure, which is part of the lint seal die dar concept. Mm. I got it. I got. It. Did 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 the Bruce uh, have the some kind of uh, the classification of the distances? Yes. You have the, the, the various distances you have. The danger zone is where you can be touched. Mm -hmm. So you better be fighting. The threat zone means that you are at an edge in which if you move even an inch closer, the person becomes nervous. In other words, you're entering his space. We call it an emotional space. Now in America, 
I found that the emotional space is different than, say, from Europeans. When I was in France or different countries where they were very, they kissed each other's cheek, they were very close, they were used to being very close to one another. In other words, their personal space was much closer. Yes, yes. Because of the... But in America, our space is very definitely much further out. Mm. So I teach what they call the threat zone. The threat zone means that we stand at a certain distance away from one another, and then I slowly move towards you, not martial arty, just move towards you. And what you do is you stand and you relax. At what point do you feel me enter your emotional space? There's a certain distance in which you actually will feel a sense of alarm and the tendency to want to step back. What is that distance? Well, I find that if you and I are practicing this, and I move on you, and you establish that, ooh, you're too close, I feel at the same time that same feeling. Mm -hmm. I might be six foot four, and you might be five foot two, but we will both feel the exact same threat zone distance. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Now, why this is important is, is that at what point distance do you train from? Do you just get up and start training? Yeah, if you want to just practice certain techniques, but if you are training for street fighting, you want to know that at a certain distance, you are invading your opponent's space and therefore setting him to alarm and make him step back. What is that distance? So that's what we train for. Why this is so critical is that if I'm going to practice technique, what distance do I practice it from? Because if I don't practice it from the right distance, I've just wasted my time. If I practice it and I feel more effective because I'm closer to you, great. Unfortunately, it won't work that way because if I get that close to my opponent in the street, he's going to back up. Mm -hmm. So I've lost my advantage. If I'm further out, I, it takes me more effort to get to him. What is that distance that is my fighting distance in which I am the most effective to attack you or to react and absorb your energy? And we call that the threat zone. Anything outside of that is the safe zone. In other words, you're further out, you're telegraphing more when you enter, uh, it, it's more distinguishable. Any closer than that, you're making your opponent too nervous, he's going to step back, you've lost the surprise advantage. Mm -hmm. We trained in distance. Threat zone, danger zone, safe zone. Safe zone. Okay. So it, it is straight for distances. Three basic distances. Three, yeah. three basic distances. Uh, what what Bruce Lee um, thought about the release from the clinch? Did there was he? no such thing as clinch. What else? I'm oh, sorry. There was no such thing as the clinch. Hey, if I if you and I are messing around, how would you get out of this? How would you get out of that? Well, in a fight, you wouldn't get me in it mm -hmm. because I'm gonna rip your head off. The thing is about a clinch, unless you're in a bar. Yes. That guy comes up and grabs you and clinches you. Yeah. You're in big trouble if he knows jujitsu and, and, and oh, puts you into a... Of course, club. of course. See, in, in other words, the main thing in judo or jujitsu, mm -hmm. to escape a position, you have to escape it before you are in the position. Because once you're in a choke position, you are in big trouble. Mostly, I don't care who you are. So... Yeah, they can practice. You can practice showing get out of this and get out. Of this. But if a guy's fairly good in, in judo or jujitsu and he puts you in a in a choke and he's you're in the choke position, you're in trouble. Of course. I don't care who you are. I don't yeah. care what you know. Mm -hmm. So so the the trick in, in practicing martial arts relative to chokes is be able to escape them before you are in the choke in the lock itself. Once you are placed in the lock, you're in trouble. And Bruce Lee in 1959, 1960 never practiced it because it didn't exist. Judo was just something the Japanese did down the street in their little dojo. But, and Bruce knew some jujitsu. I mean, judo. Don't give me understanding. He practiced it and understood it, but very little. But he didn't see that as a threat in the street. Because how are you going to get close enough to, to grab him? Mm -hmm. And Bruce wasn't a drinker. He didn't go into bars. That wasn't something like we dealt with. And, but anything that you see about Bruce and choking was much later uh, in his whole early period of time when he was uh, he knew guys like Jiro Jean LaBelle, who was a wrestler. Then you, you could see him playing around with that. But 
in fighting, nah, even to this day, nah, I don't care how good you are at judo or jiu-jitsu, you're mm-hmm. not going to get close enough to me. You know, I'm going to rip your head off first. Mm-hmm. I got it. I got it. Um, uh, can, I, can I ask about the uh, defense again, uh, just to, um, to, to take the point? Um, if uh, if the your opponent have them uh, something like side 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 strokes of the bottom uh, bottom stroke, uh, is there the uh, something different uh, defense all, uh, or it is just something that, that you already said? In in our basic training, we had just simple interruptions. We had tansao, mm-hmm. we had paksao. Mm-hmm. We had Guang Sao. Mm-hmm. Look at the three. Guang Sao was alone, mm-hmm. coming in or he's coming in, which Bruce used in an actual fight where the guy kicked at him. He Guang Sao him. It's a low sweep. Pak Sao, which is a sweeping action to slap block when you're when the person's coming in, or an outer Tan Sao to uh, block against any kind of a, a hooking uh, strike. Mm-hmm. So the puck was mainly used against a straight strike. Uh, uh, tansao against uh, any kind of a uh, hooking strike and a guang sao against anything that was from the uh, technique but the defensive technique was always built in with an offense there was never a defense by itself so this is why when we talk about a hand technique well my main point is, is that our defense are always paired with offense but I mean the tansao is paired with the chung choy. Guang Sao with the chung choy. A pak with the chung choy. So, and you got to remember, if you are going to fight, if you're within that danger zone, I'm attacking. I am assuming that you're punching at me as you're entering the, the danger zone. Because you're not in the danger zone, otherwise the fight would be on. Nobody's going to punch you in the stomach or lower as they're outside the range. It's close range fighting. So your primary techniques you're going to deal with are straight punching, uh, direct punching, hooking punching, you know, direct. So that's why you mainly use the tonsil, poxil. But, again, we are trappers. So once I engage you, I'm going to go into the trap. I'm going to become part of your energy, but I'm going to be hitting you at the same time. Mm-hmm. Very difficult for me to talk about it. It's very easy for me to show you physically for you to feel it. That's why it's very difficult to teach someone with video or especially printed. Mm-hmm. I'm going to try to with my teachable program, but it's, it's that's why it's good with Skype. A person can talk to me, show me something, and then I can say, oh, you're doing this wrong. Because I, I want to do the documentary on uh, Bruce Lee, 1959 to 60, when I knew him, you know. Whoa. That's exciting. It, it, it is a d- documentary film, yes. I'm a documentary. In other words, it's a movie. Uh, this is great. This is great. About the the, the, the defense, uh, if we have the, uh, the 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 leg kicks, was it some defense uh, difference? I'm too close to you. Mm, ah, okay. The reason you can kick someone is because they're within a certain range. Of, of course. So if I see at all that I suspect you're a kicker or you look like a kicker, I'm going to be very careful of that threat zone. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, even if you're fast, if I'm at the threat zone, I still should have enough time to react mm-hmm. should you try to kick me because I'm at, at a certain distance. I'll either pull away from you or I'll attack you, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to be within range for you to kick me. Mm-hmm. However, if I see that you are a kicker and I think there's going to be a fight. In other words, remember, you're the bad guy. I'm going to attack you. Especially if my family's around or I'm in a, you know, a, a threat situation. If I've decided that there's going to be a fight or that you are threatening in such a, de- a degree that you would be dangerous, I'm going to attack you. If I attack you, there's no way in the world that you're ever even going to get your leg off the ground before I'm in there ripping your head off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's why we did not de- practice defending against kids. It was yeah. pointless. I got it. Not in a fight. We're not talking competition. We're not talking in a ring where fighting is part of the game. Of course. No. It, it's just a street, it's just applied um, fighting. And I've known some of the best kickers. I, a friend of mine, Bill Wallace, 
I've done similar. I don't know if you know who Bill Wallace is, but he no. was called Superfoot. Superfoot back in a few number of years ago. Superfoot back in a few number of years ago could kick you before you could blink. I mean, literally, he was really, really, really good. I did a seminar with him in New York, and we're talking. And he his seminar was about kicking. Mine was about post quarter combat. Mm -hmm. And I demonstrated to him why he could never kick me, and he agreed, yeah. He could understand in a fight where he'd be in trouble. Because I told him, I said, you know, I'm either going to be too close to you or too far away, but I'm not going to be within range for you to kick me. Uh -huh. Because that's the whole, a kicker has to get within his kicking range. Very simple. Yeah, I see. I see. So, so you'll hear people, ah, he's a great kicker, he's this, he's fast, he's up. I don't care. That's why Bruce did not like kicking. Because kicking is actually, if you kick the guy, it could be very good. But if the guy knows how to close and knows distance, you've got a major problem of ever kicking him. Mm 